Hi, and welcome, everyone. I see people slowly waking up after club night, perhaps. Um, feel free. I know that it's a sort of event where you might want to drift in and out and you don't want to be super visible, but feel free to come closer so there isn't so much of a chasm between uh, us and the room. Uh, we would like this, in the end, to be a productive conversation, not only for us on the panel, uh, we're quite excited to be here, but also for you in the room. So. Uh, the mosh pit in the front is quite empty, and if anyone wants to slowly join that in the course of the day, that would be fantastic, or the morning. Uh, I'm Benjamin Gertis, and to my left, I have Charmaine Schwa, Heba Amin, and Abdu Malek Simon. Uh, and uh, we are here, as you probably know, to uh, discuss protocols of sensing. Uh, and I should say, first, we agreed to have more of a conversation between us. Uh, I'm the moderator, but will also at points speak about my practice as well. And the goal is to engage a topic together that sits perhaps in between our practices and see perhaps uh, where we four might take it together uh, with you in the room over the next 90 minutes. So I will introduce our panelists. Charmaine Chua is a Singaporean organizer, writer, and researcher living and working on the traditional lands and waters of the Chumash people and currently Associate Professor of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Assistant, Assistant okay. Did I, why did I, did I? Oh, I, I, uh, the promotion has happened. Uh, no, I just Assistant. got tenured. Okay, Associate, I'm sorry. This is on your webpage, did I? Okay, fantastic, congratulations. No, no, no. That was oh. a joke. Like, oh, no, I, I tenured you. Sorry. Yes, I wish I had such power. Okay. <laughs> that's, in then. Uh, that's not one of the protocols that we are able to enact from stage is granting of tenure. I wish it was. Um, and several other people in the room, we would also grant this to you. Uh, okay, so assistant professor of global studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, her research and teaching focuses on global political economy, post-colonial development, race and class, and technological change. She also maintains a secondary research interest in global carceral geographies and police and prison abolition. Uh, to my far left is Abdul Malik Simone, senior professorial fellow at the Urban Institute, University of Sheffield. He works on issues of spatial composition in extended urban regions, the production of everyday life for urban majorities in the global south, infrastructural imaginaries, collective affect, global blackness, and histories of the present for Muslim working classes. For three decades, he has worked with practices of social interchange, technological arrangements, local economy, and the constitution of power relations that affect how heterogeneous African and Southeast Asian cities are lived. Heba Amin, in the middle, on the couch, is an Egyptian visual artist and scholar whose work is embedded in extensive research addressing the convergence of politics, technology, and urbanism. She is particularly interested in tactics of subversion and techniques used to undermine systems as well as topics surrounding critical spatial practice and critical geography. She is presently professor of art, digital, and time-based media at ABK Stuttgart. And I am awkwardly going to introduce myself as Benjamin Gertis, American uh, artist, writer, organizer, working in video and public related formats, interested in intersections of radical politics, knowledge production, and popular imagination, uh, with projects emerging via long-term research processes and dialogue with activists, trade unionists, architects, and geographers, among others. I'm based at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, where I direct the Swedish Research Council-funded artistic research project, Ghost Platform, generating the complex image of data, labor, and logistics. So I'm very happy to be moderating this panel today with these three very compelling and excellent uh, and engaged panelists. Um, and to briefly talk about the brief briefly talk about the brief we've been given, uh, protocols of sensing. Uh, protocol implies a kind of machinic operation, uh, which we might assign to this topic and, and presume we sort of know where this is heading, and I think the four of us hopefully will take it uh, not into a direction of a more sort of global hegemonic framework, but instead find some cracks and slippages. And for me, one of the first slippages is just in this uh, 
movement between sensor and a broader notion of sensing that implies a certain ecology of what or whom might be sensed or non-sensed or even incensed in relation to these calculative processes. So if we take remote sensing as a prevalent set of operations in the present, familiar to many of us, the questions for the panel today would focus on the specific practices, research, and interventions uh, those assembled here might offer in the manner of co-thinking through the terrain of such a topic. And I would say those assembled here include you in the room, because we know there's a lot of expertise and uh, perspective that could contribute to this conversation. Uh, so I have written some overly long opening questions for each of the panelists, and we decided we would take a sort of 10-minute opening to respond, to find a point of entry into this topic for each of us, and then we'll have a conversation between us after that point. Uh, so my first question is for Charmaine. Um, I know from your event yesterday, it's like a talk show, hi. <laughs> I know from your event yesterday, yeah, your work broadly engages the supply chains and supply chains and logistics as topics in both a historical and contemporary lens, which includes organizing work alongside academic research. Within this, there are the social and political implications of algorithmic management, and then also the contours of how logistic networks are embedded and deployed differently across the global south and north in terms of interaction, extraction, and deployment of labor, often reliant on similarly global computational networks. I am curious, from your perspective, on how remote sensing changes our understanding of bureaucratic management. Does it sound too much like Sesame Street? Right? Like, uh, specifically, how does it link into your work on logistics in both a historical and present tense? And here I'm bridging your organizing and counter-cartographic work on Amazon in the present with the historical project of a logistics counter-revolution that connects directly to trans-Pacific decolonial struggles. So I serve you up this platter and please respond as you will. Thank you very much, Sherman. Thank you so much, Ben, for, ben, for moderating. Um, and for asking such a generous question. I should say that I, I'm sort of not actually going to answer it directly and not gonna talk about the Amazon work, but would be very happy to do some of that in the, in the Q&A. Um, I thought instead, I, I don't think any of us on this panel are experts on remote sensing. Um, and so I feel very much like an interloper and Ryan Bishop is in the audience, which is very embarrassing. So um, apologies for the lack of knowledge. <laughs> but I'm gonna do my best. Um, I thought what I would just start with is a kind of brief history of remote sensing um, and to sort of reconstruct from its, you know, from what I understand to be its beginnings um, into sort of how it plays into my research paradigm on logistics. Um, so I'll start with four, five photographs. Seen that? Okay. The first photograph from space was captured not by a satellite nor an astronaut, but by a missile. In 1946, from the Desert of White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, the US Army launched a V-2 rocket constructed from confiscated German, Nazi German components. Nestled between the fuel tanks of this missile was a 35mm motion picture camera, which uh, took pictures, the first pictures of Earth from space from 100 kilometers above its surface. And as you can see, the kind of grainy black and white print kind of conceals, um, as Bennett, Chen, and Gleason put it, conceals in the forging of this image um, a crucible of the World War, of American and German imperial ambition, and the theft of indigenous lands. And so, whereas maps and sort of cartographic forms of representation of the earth are often made with a kind of specific reference to their maker's objective, and you can usually see the hand of a map maker in the making of um, different kinds of topographic objects, space-borne photography and the kind of remote sensing technologies that would follow, which are all about sort of producing at a distance the image um, snapped silently above earth, give us a sense of, um, what Nicholas Mirzoff says tells us actually nothing about the maker of the image. And I, there's something interesting about the ways in which it's not even a pretension to a godlike form of capture, but is actually a sort of um, picture from nowhere. And the kinds of subjectivities and situatedness that remote sensing comes with it, I think, kind of mimics that. In the second two images, urban heat island effect maps, um, one from 1959 in London and the second from 1998 in Atlanta, um, show you two different depictions of how um, we understand energy and the environment. 
In the first heat map, scientists employed isothermic lines to indicate the distribution of temperature zones throughout London and to demarcate the gradual cooling of that city as it diffused into its less urban surroundings. And the second is a false color thermal infrared image of Atlanta, Georgia, obtained using a, space, a, a space-borne thermal sensor in 1988. When climatologists began to try to grasp the phenomenon of the urban heat island in the 1960s, um, as the architect and spatial theorist John May puts it, in a famous essay that sort of is often attributed as the root of climatology, Howard's The Climate of London, a kind of mass and long poetic allegory of metropolitan existence, which in which he writes, London's enclosed pestilential vapor and rot a cloud of sulfur, the sun itself, which gives day to all the world besides, is hardly able to penetrate here, becomes in a stroke replaced by a number, 1.579 degrees Celsius, which, the, which was the difference in temperature between London and the spaces around it. And so in a kind of transition from poetry to numeracy, we see something about remote sensing. Um, Remote sensing somehow in this kind of sleight of hand made landscape comprehensible as a kind of energetic object. And so these are pretty recent. So just to kind of um, give you a sense of what these maps are, the first isothermic map sort of maps, as you can see, with these kinds of concentric circles, the space from, from which heat flows, so from London to its outer image. Whereas in the second, what you are plotting is a set of digital points that are largely um, electronics, e electronically sensed from space-borne photography and, and mapped onto a grid in a sort of much more distance formulation. And so these are pretty recent developments. Before World War II, geographic inquiry was still governed by the possibilities and limits of ocular perception. So how maps of the world were taken were through cameras and became a sort of combination of optical perception and all the kinds of imaging um, technologies that followed from the camera to the spectrograph um, to what we have today, which is um, the kind of um, numerical image. And through these, in, so through the kind of former form of imaging, photography and cartography were kind of combined to re reproduce territory. But over the last four decades, the mode of visualization has transformed. The long history of optical geographic instrumentation was transformed into um, what John May again calls assemblages of instrumentation, which kind of expands the kind of perceptual field of our vision to include domains of mass phenomena previously unavailable to visual analysis, um, which unified the kind of world of lived experience with big data cognition that was far beyond a kind of um, unaided human sensory apparatus. And so in a sense, when we look at something like a Google Earth image or, or an image that's common to us on GIS, that's something that's simply not apprehendable by the human eye. And in a sense, what we're seeing is not really an image that we would ever be able to apprehend itself, but is um, one that's sort of doubly removed from the kind of human gaze. During World War II, these um, experiments with heat and the intensity of energy sort of um, beyond visible ocular sight really began to intensify in the field of war um, when infrared photography proved really useful not only in revealing enemy locations through a sort of great distance perspective, but also because infrared photography started to be able to see through extensive forms of camouflaging. And much of this later became automated and developed in the Vietnam War when Robert McNamara who was trying to reduce the number of US troops and military weaponry used in the war, inaugurated what he called Operation Igloo White, an assemblage of experiments with electronic sensing, aero bombing, and trip wiring that he saw as fighting what he called a cleaner war through technology. And so what you're seeing here is a spike boy electronic sensor that was used to rem remotely detect enemy movements during the Vietnam War. And Operation Igloo White started to do things like use machinic perception to um, ignite bombs on, um, from airplanes onto the ground below, um, trying to essentially sort of take out of human predictability what warfare would be like. In the late, I should also say, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A, that um, Operation Eagle White then later got transported to the US-Mexico border where it was deployed as a kind of experimentation around land border policing. Um, so I wanna sort of maybe skip forward a little bit and just say that you know, through a kind of quickening movement about amongst statistical operations, 
what these assemblages do is essentially create and grasp representations of the earth that give birth to what John May calls a managerial surface, a kind of expanding repertoire of technologies and instruments that form a kind of utterly novel space that's both real and th theoretical, um, but that is really ultimately about a kind of managerial form of imaging in which perspectival, perspectival depth becomes replaced with a kind of concept of resolution, which is how we understand the photograph today, a kind of statistical electrical simulation. And so these are what I think are useful to think about as logistical logics in which a kind of ever quickening movement among statistical operations kind of coordinate the distribution of matter and time. Um, and so it's not logistics in the kind of traditional or simplistic sense of a movement from one plot to the other, but a kind of managerial conditioning of the possibilities that pre-authorize logistical reasoning as a whole by naturalizing facticity, by naturalizing machinic prediction, by arranging in advance logistical interventions that seek to kind of operational life and um, bring it in line with the demands of quality control, just-in-time delivery, labor overheads, refrigerated shipping costs, so on and so forth. Um, and one way that I think that um, remote sensing then makes surfaces managerial in this form and logistical in this form is that it drives that kind of predictability in two simultaneous directions. It both kind of uh, is able to apprehend images that are if infinitesimally, infinitesimally small and really imperceptibly large at the same time. Um, and all of that sort of in the, in the name of a kind of smooth movement. So the last image I wanted to show is one of um, the ways in which this kind of logistics of remote sensing have been employed in precision agricultural farming for which there's sort of increasing technologies to kind of optimize farm profitability by adjusting the treatments to biophysical conditions of the agricultural field. And this is deployed in everything from remote sensing when weeds pop up and automatically sort of um, spraying weed, weed killer onto fields, but it brings a kind of whole suite of technologies, whoa, um, into, you know, from satellite positioning to guided sensors um, into the agricultural field. Can I, can I have a couple more minutes? Yes, please continue. So and much. I apologize to the panelists. This is for like the Academy Awards when they play you exactly. out. Exactly. I, I thought our yeah. continuation of people who made it to the club would be to uh, have a cheesy bass drop play <laughs> at the end of 10 minutes. So. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm almost done. But so what this image basic, the image you're seeing is a heat sensing image that's able to calculate the weight of a chicken before it's brought to slaughter to kind of bring it to its optimal weight. But under a kind of agri a modern agrologistical um, precision farming remote sensing lens, um, the ache to death time of the common poultry chicken has now, through genetic modification and breeding strategies, been reduced from uh, its natural cycle of roughly 12 weeks to six weeks. And what this basically means is that uh, agricultural logistical precision has sort of made the bird mature to its ideal slaughter um, threshold uh, to half its time so that birds now sort of get slaughtered for consumption at six weeks. And if that sort of makes any sense to you, you know, m most chickens take 16 weeks to mature. So most of what we're eating are, are, are chickens' children. And each chicken is sort of electronically marked at birth so that its growth and eventual position in the supply chain can be closely supervised. So all of this is to say that what remote sensing does in part is to think about the world as a kind of solution for supply chain management. In fact, in sort of um, supply chain management speak, um, d you know, one of the websites sort of that promotes remote sensing as a logistical technology says, data is useless unless it solves problems. And there's something in that relationship of modern managerial science to sort of speeding the efficiency of infrastructures for kind of consumption in the supply chain that conveys a kind of, um, uh, that the most effect effective forms of remote sensing actually become then effective forms of population control and supply chain management. And so in a sense, I think one of the things that happens is that remote sensing kind of replaces all of the, uh, the stuff of life, right? Uh, desire, intimacy, mystery, um, into something that sort of functions as an organization of matter. What remote sensing tries to do in its apprehension of the world is a kind of technique to turn um, itself into a technique for the bureaucratic management of life itself. 
organizing space essentially into a theater of war in all of these kinds of different domains that I've laid out. Um, so I perhaps will end there and sort of leave that as the note of, question, of, of the question that might be following because I think most of us start to think about collectives and intimacies and forms of long-term work with people in ways that sort of refuse that bureaucratic um, imagination. Um, and I look forward to hearing more about what other folks have to say about that. And again, for people still walking in, there's room in front. Thank you so much, Charmaine. Uh, that gives us a lot to digest, I think, and to respond to. Um, and now we will turn to Abdul Malik. Um, and my paragraph or multi-paragraph long question for you, which uh, you were prepared for, so I apologize, but I'm as an opening. I'm specifically interested in how you might also engage this topic drawing on the urban as a frame for perhaps what is sensed or uncounted from a distance, forms of living that don't accurately match the machinic logic and processing, and then maybe how we might reflect on these gaps or differences. In your project Life at the Margins, for example, there is an emphasis on how the unevenness of urban growth and spatial social development lead us to peripheries which produce forms of resistance and ways of living that exceed mainstream representations. And you have posed the question to what extent are contemporary manifestations of the urban marginal, marginal to the sustenance of urban life in general. So in as much as remote sensing, we have a model of distance and remoteness, a here and elsewhere, I'm wondering how the forms of living and collective affordance that perhaps don't fit neatly into this data set might inform our relationship to how we navigate this topic on the ground today, or on a more nuanced, or on a more nuanced manner in terms of global networks as experienced at the street level. It seems on a machinic register, a body zone being can be inside or outside, read or unread, counted or not, but your research would suggest the social and material complexity of urbanization generates an alongside that is neither fully in or out, a maybe perhaps impacted or affected while also navigating differently. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. And we... oh, okay, thank you. Welcome you. Um, okay, so for, for the moment, let's just assume that the scopic has two primary orientations, one of which is to amplify the uh, salience and the endurance of existing categorizations and identities. And the other, in its conceit of inclusivity uh, on being able to incorporate everything and to elaborate interoperable relations amongst everything, constantly has to invent its own vernacular, uh, constantly has to invent the terms of what these relationships are. So in the latter, extracting from popular collective efforts is aided and abetted by all of the interventions that impact directly on the sensibility of the overall urban environment generating a subjectivity that is not bound to any particular subject or clear-cut representations of what is going on. Interventions aim, for example, at how and where people walk, the loads and occupations that buildings can bear, the way spaces are designed to frame particular ways of seeing and paying attention, densities of sound that obscure or heighten discernment, and goods that are shifted across locations and types of consumption. So what transpires is a kind of detaching process, an unmaking, materialized by taking the ways people speak, the kinds of buildings they live in, the corridors along which they move, the codes by which they manage various relations, the sacrifices they make to get ahead, the risk they take to turn them into probabilities and financial values. And these probabilities are then addressed by specific media content, policy, political messages, or social engineering. But on the other hand, there's a, 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 a different trajectory of detaching. That there is a tendency toward detachment that emanates from the very expansiveness of such relationality. 
which intensifies attention to the capacity to exert some kind of control over one's surroundings. So for example, many residents of Jakarta often ask, what does it mean to be part of a larger urban region, feeling that it is not something they can get a handle on, and all the available vernaculars of citizenship and civic belonging don't provide anything really useful to grasp what the region is or how to navigate it. And so these genealogies of detachments are varied. Some emanate from the singularities of location, how infrastructural layouts, toxicities, natural elements configure specific spaces and boundaries. Others result from collective decisions to maintain distance, make internal motivations invisible, and protect economies and ways of life from encroachment pressures. Others proceed from the specific designs of new residential situations in a panoply of developments, new towns, housing projects, gated communities, and development zones. Others are simply a collective expression reflecting the desire to be left alone, to pursue other means of making life sensible and valuable to them. And circulation and movement increasingly become the practices of everyday inhabitation. While residents may not move very far, they must keep moving as a means of deflecting being the target of police, familiar judgments, restrictions, or obligations, creating a kind of detachment from a discernible relationship with place or occupation. But we all know well that the, that the poor are detached from the specifics of everyday social relations and managed either as small enterprises worthy of conditional caste transfers eliminated or incarcerated for their criminality, left alone in highly volatile situations engineered by the state through threats of eviction or service cuts to implode, or reclo relocated in highly managed relations of dependency in part-time provisional jobs and residences whose prices almost immediately placed them in interminable debt. So whatever sense of we that ensues is less a matter of a common cause than a pronoun that multiplies the fields of action that can feed into each other, an appreciation and mapping of the interlocking configurations of residence, sense, and experience that coalesce in particular settings. So the detaching is always ambivalent. It's always something that is done to and is always something being done from. And, th and, those, and, that, and those trajectories in some ways are complicit, sometimes antagonistic, but fundamentally ambivalent. So reflecting Vivero, Vivero de Castro's notions of many different natures within a singular cultural construct, different domains come to become perspectives for each other, differences without separability, as Denise Ferrer de Silva would call it, ways of living the urban in such a way that the church, for example, is a household for some, the household is the church for others, the market, the city hall, the city hall, the market, and so forth. Where commonality is not framed in terms of a specific definitional criterion, common participation in clearly defined context, but rather the simultaneity of multiple, seemingly inverted perspectives, which both maintain both separateness and inseparability. For if anything can be done for if anything can be anything else for some, yet always different for others, it is understanding in between positions that it might enable residents and researchers to better grasp all those minor shifts that propel transformation. Here, starting in the middle of things, between here and there, in the midst of all kinds of flows and efforts, may be the only viable orientation. And then quickly, a second point coming from what's often been called black logistics. And here I refer to the work of Hortense Spillers, where she says that in navigating the dilemma that blackness is both about everything and nothing, that every attempt to develop a positivity of blackness simply demonstrates the fungibility of its founding condition, that all black inventions could not institutionalize themselves according to the normative procedures of transparency and dissemination without inviting assault and denigration. About how all black people were, were situated in shadow world, what she calls shadow worlds, worlds of monstrous, monstrous intimacies, unsettling, 
inexplicable violence and generosity, inverted power. Black sense, as its only way out then, extended itself across disparate landscapes, hollows, shoals, wilds, eddies, mongols, and strange alliances and new adjacencies. So black living becomes a matter of logistical dexterity, and logistics is about flow. It's about the process of disembedding particular nodes, transit, and processing sites from the specificities of their relationships with particular locales, demographic compositions, social and economic histories, and cultural practices that require an open-ended sense of how these sites now acting as nodes can be articulated in new and various ways. It entails how places and persons are multiply situated in a plurality of different circulations. Logistics is a process that reiterates the fundamental instability of interconnectivity, as well as the potential space through which resistance and illicit uses might emerge. Thus, most logistical systems require capacities to antis anticipate instability and preempt interruptions. But black logistics anticipate instability, but instead of preemption, try to figure out ways of riding with the interruption, accompanying the interruption. Blackness, as Ronald Judy would put it, is a poetics of flow, sometimes at great costs, but as a process of reworking collective formations, switching things up and around, staying out of sight in plain sight. So black life, otherwise historically condemned to finitude, to not exceed anything but itself as an expendable other, or as the epitome of calculated life, as property, as welfare cost, as correctional probability, on the other hand, promises the infinity of the incomputable. Even as subject to wide-ranging engineering, disciplinary, correctional, compensatory, and biopolitical systems, which simply systematically attempt to corral black life within specific forms of visibility and control, what black people did with each other, how they operated in the interstices between constantly being messed with and constantly being excluded or ignored was often a matter outside of any vernacular, any accounting, fundamentally incomplete and incomprehensible to any normative form of apprehension. Wow. wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Were you done? Was that actually a tight 10? Amazing. Okay. Yes. That was amazing. And uh, okay. Thank you. And again, we digest. Uh, for Heba. Uh, now moving on. And building on this, but I sort of the notions of data bias or algorithmic inequality are quite common now, and it seems your work in some sense engages the spatial and territorial underpinnings and implications of these operations. At the same time, the description of this panel perhaps suggests a more coherent and efficient narrative of remote sensing phenomena that glosses over the contingency, illogic, and patched together nature of many of these networks uh, and We've just heard an amazing contribution along those lines. We could agree it's true that perhaps the scale, precision, and speed have increased, but I'm interested in your perspective on working with the imprecision and uncanniness of the details. To re-examine the technical and juridical frameworks as not fully operative, not as totally on lockdown as advertised. And then specifically your relationship to aesthetic research practices or artistic strategies to reframe the unexpected extensions or contradictions here, perhaps to intervene in the prevailing popular or political narratives. And I will stop there and welcome you. Thank you, Benjamin. And thank you, Charmaine and Abdumalik, for those amazing um, presentations, because I think, I think I'm seeing now why we were put together. <laughs> I think they're, they're fitting together quite nicely. Um, and so, I mean, we already know that algor algorithms are, are not mere abstractions. Um, they're programmed from within the political and social biases out of which they emerge. And of course, this has already been addressed many times, including at this conference. Um, and that they reflect all too well the predispositions of our socio-political orders. So there's an agenda there. 
And the problem that I find often with discussions on remote sensing and algorithmic vision is that we talk about the errors or problems in the computational system itself, as opposed to looking at the inherently problematic constructs on which the data is originally based. And so how can we seek accountability in opaque machine learning systems that to an extent are now removed from the logic on which they are originally based. And for that reason, I think it's essential that we situate our technologies within a historical context. And I think this is what my artistic practice is predominantly preoccupied with. And so if you know my work, um, you may have heard this anecdote a million times, um, but this image, I like to start with this image here. Um, um, it's, it's a photograph of a stork um, from Rostock University in northern Germany. Um, and it's a very interesting story of a bird that was shot with a spear in Central Africa in the early uh, 19th century, but survived. And it flew thousands of kilometers all the way to Europe on its migratory path and ended up in Germany and was hunted by a hunter and killed. What's interesting about this bird is, in fact, it was the first time within the European imaginary that Europeans understood actually where storks migrated to. And the predominant theory up until that point, and this is the 19th century, this is not so long ago, the predominant theory up until that point is that they migrated to the moon. And the reason that I like this story is it really kind of visualizes and allows you to understand um, the European imaginary in relation to distance and geography, that somehow the moon that we can see in the sky is at much, uh, much closer proximity um, than Central Africa. So Central Africa becomes kind of the alien territory. And so much of my artistic work is preoccupied with the colonial mechanical eye, and particularly from the aerial perspective, as it relays the logic of colonial expansion. Um, I first thought photography was art, and you know, sometimes it is, but then I realized it's mostly surveillance, and I grapple with this idea as an artist. Um, I'm always questioning these technological tools, particularly tools of surveillance and warfare, and the ways that they're intrinsically linked to particular geographies, and in my case, I'm really looking at how a lot of these uh, technologies of warfare have emerged from um, geographies in the Middle East. So when I started investigating a, a viral media story in 2013 about a stork captured and jailed in southern Egypt because it was accused of being a spy due to an electronic migration device strapped to its um, back, and this is the actual picture of the bird, I didn't realize that it would actually lead me to piece together the history of the development of drone warfare. Um, and I began what I thought was an investigation on paranoia and the absurdity of spy birds, only for it to unravel the complex historical development of drone warfare against the backdrop of Middle Eastern geographies. And I also quickly discovered, as many of you might know, that spy birds really are a thing. <laughs> um, so in my work, uh, the stork kind of becomes the vehicle through which the paranoid age of drone warfare is confronted. Um, and I work a lot with drone footage um, and kind of piecing together these historical narratives. But basically, the bird's eye view put forth this new perspective constructed by empirical data and technological pro progress that came to represent modernity. Um, however, while aerial imaging tools were aimed at object objectively simulating the bird's perspective, perspective through machinic vision, new scopic regimes ultimately reflected the imagination of their architects. So the colonial lens framed territory elsewhere as free for the taking. And according to the logic of the modern nation state system, European colonizers felt they were entitled to the territories they invented. So we know too well the idea of desert landscapes as terra nullius or nobody's land and the ways in which colonizers wanted to make the desert bloom. Um, the representational aspiration of the aerial image was abandoned from the outside, outset in favor of ideological pursuits and a reproduction of colonial practices that were anything but neutral.
I would say um, this perhaps of photography in general at this time. In fact, um, kind of sticking with the theme of birds, the branch of science of ornithology and the emergence of ornithology as a scientific discipline technically began in the 18th century as an official form of science. Um, and the broader interest in avian landscapes paved the way for territorial control in three dimensions and a Eurocentric world order justified by science. Um, this distancing and framing of science allowed for complete freedom to experiment elsewhere. As with the aerial photographs, land was free for the taking in the colonial mindset. And in the late 19th century and early 20th century, birds were being used to survey and map territories. Um, so I'm particularly fascinating, fascinated with the militarization of animals in general, um, but specifically how they play an integral role in, in creating the very image that justifies a sort of colonial expansion. Geomatic instruments further nurtured a new structuring of space geared towards digital mapping designed to accommodate corporate and military demands. Seeing the world from above introduced a new vertical power hierarchy visualized by seeing machines. And to Donna Haraway's notion of situated knowledge or the inherent positionality on knowledge in any given context, who is doing the gazing? So even while aerial technologies evolved with more precision, high-tech weaponry was developed to legitimize conquest. Obviously, dominating airspace was not merely about how to weaponize birds into policing territories and applying social control over entire populations from above, but was and still is about possessing the aerial vantage point in order to extract value from territory. So with the rapid advancement of automation technologies, however, robotics companies are no longer dependent on the domination of the aerial perspective through the production of images alone. They're now turning to what they call bionic thinking, or a transfer of knowledge from nature to technology. The technical advancement gleaned from the weaponization of animals has birthed drones that are increasingly indistinguishable, indistinguishable from, from real birds. And here you have an image of a, a drone uh, that looks like a festo bird, but is, is um, <laughs> contemplated, that crashed and landed um, on the border of uh, Afghanistan. So now machines are talking to machines, producing data or images for other machines to act upon. Of course, the images they produce are not images that we understand. And we've established systems that have taken the human eye out of the process and in turn propped an algorithmic gaze, which is much more opaque. We're not dealing with the act of seeing and acting and therefore have removed a human actor from reasonability. So when remote sensing technologies allow for this kind of abstraction, um, like warfare at a distance through lethal autonomous weapon systems, human values also become abstracted. So how can we deal with the issue of morality at a distance, and especially at this point, when the scale is so monumental? Are we too deep in it to backtrack and correct ourselves? And given, um, again, the context in which these technologies are developed, is it even possible to kind of extract the, the inherent problematic politics that are embedded in these technologies? However, it's not only about accountability, because it's about how to address and empower the people whose agency has been stripped by the technologies that police them through remote sensing practices. In this sense, um, I see it as my role as an artist to unpack the implication of such visual production and to problematize the abstraction and exploitation of images that were violent and oppressive in the first place. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah. Yeah, please. It's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I mean, I have more questions, but I think also we can start questioning each other. Um, I would maybe just throw a question out of, um, I, I really appreciate the historical and 
sort of regional specificity of each of your contributions. And maybe to throw a broad question, maybe we're beyond that, but we, we discussed this, that having a question of what it means to discuss remote sensing specifically now, what's at stake. Um, and it strikes me that uh, often as, as these things are discussed, there's either a kind of territorial project or it's about an individual subjectivity. And uh, I'm quite interested perhaps in the places where, for example, I know you've worked more on transversal collectives and organizing and, and sort of how we, we could, so the, the first general question is what does it mean, what's at stake, but also like on a kind of non-individual only level. If we, I think that often these processes are sort of, your contribution was so great in, in denying the kind of universality of this as a condition, right? That the contours of this are very specific and navigate in very specific ways. I don't know if that's something we can develop together, but I'd like to see. So that would be my uh, pitch on the table, but anyone else who wants to ask a question of someone else, please. That too soft on the moderating, is that it? Yeah. Can you just reiterate your question one more time? Sure. <laughs> yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll pick up the question and, and see how I tell you how I heard it, which yeah. is that one of the things that seems to emerge from our various engagements with the, the various forms of coloniality of, of remote sensing or 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 seeing as calculating is the ways in which one might think of um, resistance not really as an adequate term, but um, evasion, seizure, black logistics. And I, I suppose maybe this is a, a kind of more general question about sort of how we see the tactics of anti-seizure or the tactics of refusal that might lie within, um, you know, protocols of, of sort of um, living within a kind of remote sensing world. And so, Maybe the maybe my direct question was for for Abdul Malik because at one point, when you talk about Ferreira de Silva's kind of conception of difference without separability, um, one thing I think about a lot in the sort of thinking about the racialization of logistics um, is how Jody Melamed terms racial capitalism a technology of anti-relationality, and and in the sense that she evokes it, um, capitalism acts in a sense as a kind of effort to separate what would otherwise be collective forms of being, of thinking, of being together. So maybe that would be, I would love to kind of hear how we all sort of pick up on this question of resistance or refusal in different ways. Thank you for making my question an even better and more focused question. Uh, so Abdul Malik, do you want to take a stab at replying to Charmaine's question, if you will? I mean, I, I, I remember back in the day, uh, and before even Laurel used the word, the black camera, the black camera was uh, a notion that was invoked by, you know, pe people in my neighborhood from Brooklyn, five percenters, okay? It was a very important notion from the five percenters, this notion of the black, the black camera. And what did the black camera record? They always talked about the black camera recording the firmament. Well, a very interesting notion of the firmament, you know, not something that is, you know, you know, like that song, build your house on the Lord, you know, like you build, you know, some, but, <laughs> but the firmament as something that always is in the process of, like magma, always in the process of of, of a flow, you know, the way Glissant talks about it, how, where do we launch our boats? How do we, how do we live in the middle of something that has no embankment? How do we, how do we configure a sense of solidarity within? And this is not to obviate all of the important tropes of black struggle, you know, all of the important tactical historical forms of organization and resistance that have enabled black life to survive, to, to do more than survive. But for the five percenters, this was the, this, this notion of anticipating that the, 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 the notions of intimacy through physical proximity, through emplacement, through consolidating something in place, 
and being able to represent that and being able to, to chart a historical narrative within a particular territory over time could not be the sole object of investment, could not be the sole object of, of effective investment. That rather the sense of, of, of intimacy, the sense of being together, the sense of a, of a kind of collective we, had to be developed through a whole increasingly varied, heterogeneous series of gestures. Gestures and, and, and were invented words and ways of looking at each other and ways of acknowledging each other, of certain kind of popular sayings. And, 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 and so in, 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 in some way, this, this kind of living through being disembedded living through always in some sense the, 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 what Spillers would call the enfleshment of something that, is, that doesn't have a kind of genealogical sense to it, um, is in, in a way a, a kind of exigency in some way, particularly as for many urban inhabitants, the, the priority is one of circulation. You know, there's long been the sort of giving up on the, on the ability to consolidate oneself in place and to invest in that kind of notion of a, of a life over time rooted some, somewhere. And I think that that, you know, so that, that, that in some ways has to complement our, our, our understanding of, of, of politics in, 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 in some way. And then just maybe one final observation is like, because I was watching it on this 23-hour flight, is the, the, the television show Fauda. So th there's this conceit on the part of intelligent agencies that they can see everything, that, it, that there's nothing out of you. Everything is, everything is right there. But what's interesting is that's also complemented with the sense of operatives operating within Palestinian territory of being able to simulate every aspect of Palestinian life on the ground. So there's a kind of, there's a, the, the scopic on one hand is an intimacy that is, that, is, that is configured from a distance and then a distance that is configured through intimacy because the, the, the machine on the ground is only simulating everything about Palestinian life. So what gets lost in this is the notion of common sense. Common sense completely disappears. Common sense being the ability to negotiate some kind of disposition, some kind of sense that we're in the same bus somehow, regardless of whether we're complementing each other and, 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 and antagonists. So the whole sense of, of, of what it means to be proximate, to be together, is something that's it's is so dis suspended that how do you anticipate a kind of politics that somehow works and lives through that suspension? I'd like to follow up on that um, because I think you touched some really crucial points there. Um, one of the images I showed in my um, in my slides is a an aerial photograph um, that comes from a collection of um, the American colony which is an evangelical uh, Christian um, utopian sect originating from Chicago that kind of transported to Jerusalem. Um, and they became, um, they developed a sort of uh, photo um, lab and became some of the earliest photographers um, documenting aerial landscapes of, of Palestine. And so of course for them what was important was to depict um, the kind of um, vast landscape as empty territory, but to kind of preserve this idea of like the holy biblical um, imagination of the landscape um, that you know they wanted to preserve and kind of completely eliminate any imagery of a modern society um, that already lived there. And so of course these images perpetuated a certain politics and a certain narrative that we still live with today more than a hundred years later. And so when you're talking about um, remote sensing, and I'm specifically um, thinking about um, technologies of warfare that have developed out of this region, and what I'm preoccupied with in, in my project, 
um, is that a lot of the data that's being collected is being collected from the, this kind of documentation, um, these early photographs that were um, basically contrived to put forward a particular narrative. And so when you find yourself in a situation today where these technologies of remote sensing are used not only to surveil and control the population, but to also predict the future. Um, and, and so predictive technologies in this region being particularly problematic because it's about anticipating crime that they assume is going to happen. And so um, there have been several Palestinians in the last several years who've been arrested based on the probability of them committing a crime and not based on any kind of crime that has actually been committed. And so um, in that kind of crisis, in the schism, <laughs> how, do we, how do we deal with that kind of narrative and how do we put our faith in these kinds of technologies that are inherently violent and biased towards particular populations? And I think this is something that I don't know where one begins to contemplate how to <laughs> deal with that kind of struggle. And, 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 and I mean, in the case of resistance and um, tactics of refusal, there's no power to do that, actually, for certain populations. Where do they begin? to kind of negate these, these very oppressive systems that are imposed on them in this kind of omnipresent manner. I don't know if anyone here has solutions. <laughs> I would, I guess, also say that one of the predicaments then that I think you're identifying very well is that if you, uh, and, and this is probably known to people in the room, right, but it's, it's really this question of if, if what you're doing maybe in a kind of traditional, critical or artistic aesthetic sense is to sort of uh, visualize or point out or highlight the very sort of specific operations of oppression or violence inherent in these systems, the question very quickly becomes how to do so without helping the system optimize itself, right? And it's a very simple question, but I think mm -hmm that uh, it becomes one of how we navigate these systems in ways that don't also contribute perpetually to their own improvement against the things we're trying to do. And so, yes. I don't know where that takes us, but I wanted to reflect on your... I, I, I would love to respond to that. Please. I think picking, picking up on Hebe's kind of question of how do we respond to systems that are so inherently sort of embedded in a kind of colonial gaze that, that makes any form of practiced resistance impossible, and, and certainly those are embedded in different contexts. One of the ways that I've tried to work through this question is to kind of borrow from the operaismo tradition and to think about um, logistics and capitalism and remote sensing technologies as counter-revolutionary and as counter-revolutionary in the sense that they are historically and in the present meant to build into their techniques um, ways to evade the, the kind of um, uh, struggle of, of workers, of people who are trying to live within them. So there's on the one hand the way that Abdul Malik sort of thought is the helping us think through what it means to live while embedded in ways that are incomprehensible to seizure. And then I think there's also, there are also traditions of counter logistical um, post colonial subjectivities that desire to seize in return, right? To counter seize. Um, and so in some of the archival work I've been doing across Southeast Asia, um, you know. At a certain moment in the 1960s, as logistical technologies are really starting to build up, one of the things that emerges in terms of a kind of desire for counter seizure is, is both a kind of response at scale. So um, Indonesia started to think about a kind of anti-colonial economic reparations that resulted from 1963 to 66 during the confrontation with um, the British-backed Malaysia in um, massive nationalizations of wharfage companies, ports, um, plantations from British-owned companies that were sort of then pulled into the in Indonesian nation state. So at one level, there's a kind of effort for, th you know, in the history of logistics about um, thinking about anti-colonial efforts as a kind of effort to kind of take back from um, the colonial gaze what it had sort of taken away. 
And then at another level, I think um, there were also forms of seizure that were not so easily encapsulated within the political or national elite. So this is the same time that things like Lloyd's List, which was a maritime insurance agency, started to calculate loss prevention on the basis of coordinated labor struggles. And so in, the, in a kind of scatter plot map, labor struggles kind of um, kind of is at the far end, especially when they were multi-port closures, at the far end of like severe impact and, and high damage and high unpredictability. And part of that unpredictability came from the fact that post-colonial workers were just trying to get what they needed to eat, right? So they were seizing and pillaging um, uh, bales of food at the port, they were thinking about forms of pillaging, they were rioting in ways that were just very hard to predict and for um, colonial police forces to control. So I suppose maybe that's sort of a way of responding to the question about, um, you know, what does it mean to, to think about um, scale when we're sort of um, organizing in some ways with intimacies that actually evade capture. That's one way to think about it, that, you know, as much as um, these technologies attempt to capture through predictability and algorithmic mapping different forms of um, you know, counter, creating counter-revolutionary responses, that, that those are always a response to revolution, right? Or they're always a response to insurgency that, that sort of comes up in different ways. And so there's a way that I think it's useful to think about the, the autonomous position that these are, a history of technology is also a history of resistance, or a history of technology is also a history of insurgency. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to follow that up on our panel? Yeah. I mean, maybe it's just paraphrasing what you said, and maybe my basis is also coming from a kind of technological perspective, and I mean, or the basis of what I understand the sort of brief of this panel, but I, I think the something I've kind of clung to, and I'm not sure it's true, so I'd like to ask, is, is exactly the sort of question of whether colonial technologies within them always contain the conditions of their own undoing, those possibilities. And, and of course, there are possibilities, uh, as long as there are human rogue sort of whistleblowers, things like that, but also within the way technologies are trained and deployed, are they creating the conditions for their own decolonial undoing? I paraphrase K. Wayne Young saying this, who is talking more about the colonial university in the US also training decolonial subjects, right? That even though it is the colonial university that people result from this who are the opposite, right? And I, I wonder if we can on this scale or on the scale Hibbert, that you're talking about actually see the conditions of any sort of undoing or rather it's about navigating within this aerial map. I mean, I wonder about that too and I'm often very pessimistic about the idea. I actually, um, as much as I try through my own work to believe in this idea that technology can be part of the undoing of the colonial constructs that are embedded within it, I find that the more and more that I um, explore it through my artistic practice that I'm constantly butting heads with the fact that it does quite the opposite. Um, I also kind of am coming from the experience of um, uh, t more than 10 years after the so-called Arab Spring and the ways of, there were hopes that were kind of really banking on technologies that would help democratize um, certain societies that not only failed miserably, but worked against its own people. And so the very tools that people were using to emancipate themselves in the end ended up oppressing them even further. And so coming from that perspective, I think it's very hard to see out of the colonial logic, actually, of these technologies. Um, and I've become increasingly skeptical of actually using these technologies as a way to, to critique <laughs> those systems. So, um, so I, I don't know, I mean, I question this idea of um, technology being also a history of resurgence, even in its many attempts. And I think the attempts are positive things, but, um, but um, perhaps I, I, I have this kind of dark cloud that I can't see out of to see examples where that's been really been the case.
Yeah, this is this is not a counter to what you you you've said. Just a, a kind of no, another another plane, which is if one of the one of the the byproducts of deploying what you called colonial technologies was as as a kind of individuating me mechanism of being able to more proficiently determine who counts, who counts in what way, uh, what kind of valuation do particular lives have, um, what particular valuation do particular relationships amongst those lives have, and also this kind of impetus for people to speak. This is who I am. This is what I want. This is what I will bring to the table. This is me. This is me. That somehow, in some ways, facilitates a kind of apparatus of, of, cap, of capture. What, what, for whatever confluence of reasons, economic, political, that go into producing a disposition, an urban disposition, which I see increasingly operative in the cities in sort of southern latitudes in which I work, is like, where have people gone? Where are you now? You were here. You were here in this neighborhood. But now you're not there anymore, so where, 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 are, where are you? And the question of where are you is a kind of, to a certain extent, a kind of, dis, a kind of dispersal a kind of sense of, uh, of itineraries of circulation, of opportunistic, of, of even the, the, the configuration of the self into an increasingly logistical object. Let me perform what I know in any particular way in order to avail myself to certain kinds of affordances and opportunities. I don't even commit to a particular version of myself. Let me have multiple versions that I, that don't come to represent me. It's not me. It's just a, a means of. It's a currency almost of, of circulation of. And so there's a kind of reconfiguration of social bodies across many different kinds of dispositions, locations, activities, one thing flowing and leading to a, another. And I'm not, I'm not offering this as a kind of mode of resistance. I'm not offering this as a kind of romantic kind of, but it just seems this, this, sh this shift of what it means to inhabit the urban is such that the limitations of the colonial, the byproducts of the implementation of colonial technologies create something that perhaps was, perhaps was the aspiration to, to completely unsettle, and, and unsettle is what's taking place. But the process of resettling is a much more problematic, uh, problematic effort, which I think reveals some of the limitations of those very, of those very techniques. Thank you. Yeah, I, just to respond, I, I think what you're saying in a very simple sense to me makes us also think that we need new political imaginaries, right? If, if sort of popular assembly or public assembly or sort of a kind of urban assembly is one vision of a kind of manifestation or resistive moment, that's clearly not what's happening in what you describe and the resettling we sort of needs to be reimagined what that could become. You know, that, would be my very simple response. Uh, I see now we have, would either of you like to respond? We have about 20 minutes left, okay. Uh, and we have, we're having a great time up here. Uh, but is there anyone in the room who would like to tell us what we're missing? Yeah, I see a hand in the back, in the far, I can barely see that far, okay. Yes, no, I'm, <laughs> yeah, you can add to the conversation, I'm, yeah. The, the microphone is coming to you, yes, yeah. Hello? Oh my God, that's so loud. 
Um, this question is mostly for Charmaine. Um, I was curious to hear your thoughts on remote sensing, logistics, and this idea of managerial um, surface. Um, as it relates to remote sensing of the body, so for example, things like Apple Watches or Garmin's, um, or other kind of wearable devices, and how that this idea of sensing of the body and the self kind of plays into logistics and other kind of supply chain and business side um, relevant kind of issues. Thanks so much for that question. Yeah, I think that that's, that's precisely, that's, a, that's an exactly right question to ask, and, and I'm thinking about what Malik just said about the ways in which remote sensing both produces the distance of the kind of numerical image, but it also requires, through sensors that are placed on the ground, a kind of um, intimacy as well. And so, you know, many of remote sensing technologies aren't just satellite imageries that are captured at a distance. They also require, right, the, the, um, the, the remote sensing uh, sensor that's placed in, in place. And so, Part of what gets produced through remote, remote sensing, I think, is a simultaneous relationship between the large scale and the intensely intimate form of sensing that requires and has created these forms of, um, you know, deeply, deeply surveillance um, forms of technology. So there's, I think, a, a relationship between the tracking of the supply chain as a whole that leads to a kind of desire for that that managerial logic to be embedded into the body. Um, and it, there's really, I think, a, a natural kind of way in which that leads into the most recent experiments with um, logistical management companies doing a lot of work to um, create wearables, exactly as you say, that are about um, monitoring the body's movement to a kind of infinitesimal uh, fraction, right? So Amazon just patented a wristwatch that um, vibrates if you move too far out of the inventory bin if you're not reaching for the package that you do. And that same wristwatch um, calculates time off task, so if you reach more than 30 minutes off task, um, which constitutes things like peeing, talking, uh, taking a coffee break, you get disciplined. So there are forms, I think, in which logistical technologies are developing both that kind of the, the God-seeing eye of, of the kind of um, managerial logic from a distance and kind of imputing it into a real desire to control the body at the, at the tiniest scale, and, and those things are, are definitely related. But I guess I just wanted to say in, in quick response both to this and the question before that um, one of the things that strikes me about the kind of hopelessness of whenever we talk about surveillance and the massiveness of colonial technologies, it can feel really as if there's, there's not much fighting back that we can do. Um, and I think to the question of whether these, you know, colonial capitalist objects contain their own tendencies um, for their own destruction, I think that you know that comes from a Marxist tradition, right? Of thinking dialectically about the ways in which economic capitalism itself contains its own seeds of destruction, and I, I want to really, I guess, the way that I try to think about this is that economic crisis doesn't naturally produce political crisis, right? A capitalist recession doesn't naturally produce the fall of capitalism. COVID doesn't naturally produce the fall of capitalism in different kinds of ways. It merely produces a new terrain of struggle. And so I think the question for us really has to be how do these various forms of managerial management, for example, provide ways for us to, you know, think from the ground up and in a, in a sort of materialist fashion about ways to build off of um, what colonial technologies are trying to do to us um, and to, to kind of create the terrain of struggle from there. Other questions? Um, maybe I'm just thinking aloud. So I'm thinking about this quote from Audrey Law, like you can't dismantle the master's house with master's tool. So like how can we actually subvert this? And I'm also thinking about James Scott's book of the art of non being governed, but it's in the highland of Southeast Asia. So how can we actually think about in the urban scenario? How can we actually escape or kind of hide, or yeah. Now, how can we actually resist? 
That's a fantastic question, and I think we might need more than 15 minutes to answer it, but I don't know if anyone up here wants to take the ball and run with it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 th I think it, it's also important to, to see the, appreciate maybe is too strong a word, but at least pay attention to the kind of work of long-term, long-term institutions that have in some ways provided a kind of platform for, I'm thinking about Imbaba, for example, the, the great working class neighborhood of the South, you know, um, the former bastion perhaps of, uh, of Ikhwan, but even to this day, even under severe repression of uh, the CC government, of all that's taken place in Cairo, people still have their associations. People still have their institutions that they participate in for decades and decades. And what's important about those institutions is the sense that the residents feel that they have, a, they have opened to them is a kind of endless sense of connections, of possibilities, even though the people that populate their everyday life may be the same people day in and day out, but it's with the conviction that their participation in these institutions potentially avails them thousands and thousands of other possible kinds of, of connections, that they're part of that kind of sense of of, of a sociality that no one can govern, no one has any kind of clear frame for. But that was, that's, the, that's the effective power of the participation in these, in, in the, in these, in these institutions. So we should, not, we should you know, pay attention to things that have been long honed, vulnerable, precarious as they may be. There's something worth still you know, um, in that kind of pursuit. Thank I, you for that. I'll just quickly say, I mean, yesterday I gave a talk and sort of ended it by encouraging us to think at scale but to organize with intimacy. And that's maybe one way to get at that question and, and to agree with Malik in the sense that um, organizing through struggle or building those terrains of struggle can't respond to logistical rationality with the same logics of efficiency that sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of, con uh, constrain the entire sort of fact of our existence, but have to sort of really be based on um, what it looks like to build long term and through these kinds of collaborations that evade, that not so much sort of try to evade the gaze of coloniality, but, but organizes in the open through it. So one thing that I think, you know, I've tried to do in some of the organizing work that I have engaged in, in with Amazon workers has been to say, we're not trying to do subterfuge by talking in code words or doing things in secret, but we're gonna organize with such force that um, no matter what surveillance techniques attempt to do, it can't stop the forms of kind of um, multi-work multi stoppages that, that we've been trying to build towards. So that's one form of answer. And I, I wanted to just also give Benj the opportunity to respond as a moderator because you've been a wonderful, generous question answer, but you're also a cultural producer of work that tries to bridge these kinds of questions of art and activism and resistance. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, okay, so I was thinking a bit about the institutional question and also just a kind of spatial question that came out of, Charmaine, your presentation yesterday. I don't know if people saw it, but it's, it's very clear in the question from the back that um, the possibility just to inhabit certain spaces in a way where people can safely communicate is, is one of the tools that is used against not only workers, but all of us in different ways, right? So I, th I think like in the case of Amazon, I mean, you're organizing smaller facilities where people are actually able to talk more, right? In, in a very simple sense. Uh, and what I have seen working with, uh, for example, uh, pickers in, uh, I'm not sure they have them in Germany, but they must, these sort of like food delivery warehouses, is that a bunch of people will work in the same refrigerated space, but they're all wearing headsets and 
you know, can sort of make eye contact but aren't actually able to communicate with each other. So then if we're talking about, you know, where are the spaces, it's a very deliberate strategy to keep people from being able to talk, right? That you're, you're all in a headset, whether or not you're being tracked so that you can move or not, I think it's very clear that the sort of managerial surveillance logic being deployed is one where people just can't converse uh, there aren't break times, there's no water cooler, coffee, blah, 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 right? So, so I think finding institutions that may not even, as Abdul Malik is saying, may not even take on these things specifically as resistance strategies, but as places where uh, forms of communication are not inherently tracked and prevented is something that's very uh, important as a kind of way of inhabiting this world together. That doesn't really answer my role in it, though. Uh, but I, I guess I also then have tried to think of art and artistic strategies as ways that groups that are already involved in some effort to self-organize or self-represent uh, can be collaborated with in a way that is not extractive, that is not sort of artists parachuting in and thinking that we have the answers, but actually sort of complement and amplify those struggles, right? And, and uh, that's something that I think a lot of people could do more. You know, I, I'm often surprised I'm the only one showing up to things uh, in certain contexts, and so I know there are other people in the world, in the room doing this, but that would sort of be my kind of very simple position, yeah. If I can add to that, and I, I hate to be the pessimist on this, on this <laughs> um, panel, um, because um, I believe in everything that, that you guys are saying, and, and I also practice, as an artist, I also practice um, these forms of resistance. But I also just can't help um, thinking about the doom and gloom of, of you know, scale is important here, and, and the fact that um, artificial intel intelligence and this predictive logic of, of these neural networks are in collusion with the military. Um, and and um, and so it's not just about um, kind of these oppressive systems that we live within, but it's what's being predicted for the future. And when the human element is then uh, removed from that and normalized um, by way of sort of evading any of the kind of moral um, um, implications of these technologies, and we can kind of you know keep that at, at a distance what do we do then and i think that's really kind of the lingering question here and not that any of us can solve at the moment but um how um do these forms of resistance kind of factor into that and do they when we've kind of separated ourselves from the machines that we've developed <laughs> sorry no, I think we need some pessimism. Anyone in the room want to weigh in on this? No? Okay. Maybe you came with a predetermined pessimism. pessimism. I'm not sure, but... Uh... Yes, someone in front. I see a hand. The microphone will slowly make its way to you. I mean, I, I, would, I guess I would just say, while the microphone is making its way, that, you know, the late, great Mike Davis used to say, whether you believe that the revolution will come or not, you have to fight. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the, that's the response, right? It's, it's whether you learn how to live embedded in these worlds or to resist them, but you, ha you have to fight. Right. And I, sorry, I, yeah, we take your question, and then if there's time, I, I continue. Please, go ahead. Thank you, thank you all. Um, just on your um, note, uh, you said we are helping the system optimize itself. I just wondered, whether in the examples you all gave, whether there is a hierarchy of reproducing violence through, uh, for example, uh, you know, repurposing technologies versus artistic strategies versus just the act of making critique. So maybe not thinking so much, you know, is there a way to resist that, that is kind of pure, just of the forms of resistance is, are some less bad than others. Could you just restate repurposing versus what was the second thing? Um, artistic strategies, okay. so like okay. interventions. Because I feel that with some artistic strategies, you can, you can only do it once. Like uh, Heber's Your Brilliant Homeland uh, intervention. <laughs> it can't happen again, probably. <laughs> yeah. True. 
I mean, the entertainment industry is pretty stupid. It could happen again, I think. It just, you have to be smart about it. But that's a great question. Yeah, does anyone want to respond? I mean, since you addressed me, um, I think that it's also difficult to predict what strategies work in the case of whether it's revolution or, uh, you know, a hack <laughs> in the media. Um, so, I mean, to Charmaine's point is that we just have to keep fighting and some of these things land and sometimes they don't. Um, but I think what's important specifically for cultural workers is to problematize um, the strategies at the forefront. And that's something that I like to do with my work because I, um, I'm often in conflict actually with the tools that I'm using and how I'm t using them and how I'm critiquing that the, the problematization of it becomes kind of the forefront of the work and it becomes a way to at least open a discussion about actually how can we talk about these things in where in most spaces, in most countries in the world, we can't actually talk about them openly. So, you know, that's maybe my sliver of like optimism of is there space in which, in which we can collectively think through um, forms of resistance together. I wanted to pick up on the sort of question of intimacy and at what scale we think about resistance and just say that to me it's also very interesting not, I mean I think art and uh, academia to some extent are really good at tracking the kind of most innovative uh, ways that capital is sort of being sort of redeployed or um, reconstituting itself or the most sort of violent or oppressive or like the sort of um, the limits of these cases, and I think that it's also very important that we find the most sort of mundane instantiations, these sort of small shifts, and I, I think that your contribution is sort of talking about in, in a certain context, but that uh, it's not always the sort of biggest scale things we find we can resist, and so organizing at scale is also, I mean, people already are resisting in very, very small ways that they don't understand, right? I mean, if you look at the the kind of uh, white collar work at home popularity of, of like mouse jigglers and, and devices that make it look like you're using your computer even when you aren't. Like these little, that, like that's a completely unorganized thing that if you look at how many of these have been sold in the past 24 months, it's an insane product that no one was really paying attention to before. And it's just people who want to appear that they're sitting at a computer when they're not, right? And, and so if we find things like that that are absolutely about remote sensing, uh, there's no sort of organizational imaginary in that, but people know that they're being controlled and oppressed, right? And, and so the question is, uh, in these frameworks, do we give a kind of language or a format or some sort of imaginary that goes beyond those things? And I think Charmaine very astutely pointed out, it doesn't have to respond at that scale, right? What are the little crevices? Uh, but yeah, we should be pessimistic, it's dark. but but also shake that mouse and walk away from your computer. <laughs> okay, we have a question in the back now. Yeah, I think we have time for two more questions and then we're, we're in yellow time, but this is great that now we're having a conversation. Hi, in terms of um, spaces for resistance, one of the most powerful spaces for me was uh, ACT UP in New York and the, it seemed one of the most uh, powerful um, activist movements that actually gained real traction and real communications with people like Fauci and, you know, in the institutional hierarchies of power and knowledge. It seemed, and possibly the reason for its success is its rootedness in the body, the fact that sex and mortality and the urgency of people fighting for their lives, literally, gave that movement an extraordinary power and also the relationship between feminism, the lesbian groups that part, the partnered and became allies with the gay men who were so, uh, so decimated were very powerful. So maybe some of the answer to this question is resituating some of these practices in the body in a more literal sense. And I don't think that's the contradiction to technology. And I think sometimes this dichotomy about technology and the body is very overdone. And I think it's, uh, it's important to find new bridges and ways of connecting those 
entities in ways that can re-engage with those uh, movements. And also those movements continue to exist through archives. There's a recent book called Let the Record Show that came out that draws on the archives of individual testimonies that is quite extraordinary. And I think this, uh, and that's situated in technology in the new powerful spaces for archiving possibilities. So I think connecting technologies of um, disambiguation, if you like, with, uh, the, with the potency of, uh, of activism that's rooted in the body and in, in our mortality and, and in our sexuality is the way to go. Thank you very much for that comment. We're in red time, but we had one more question. Uh, let's try to take this, please. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I guess I maybe want to follow up on some of the things that have been talked about. And sure, I mean, it's something you were, you know, sort of saying about, um, you know, Mike Davis, and I was also coming to think about, like, we have to think about these things dialectically, and also something like Robin D.G. Kelly talks about is to understand something to us now that might look like a defeat is actually a victory because of certain gains that might have been made for you know, queer liberation or trans liberation, and we can see the backlash of those things. And so trying to really have a longer perspective of particular histories of struggle and how much that also relates to the forms of site specificity or the historical implications that we have to understand what particular things might work when we're engaging with, I think what you're also just saying is like a diversity of tactics, you know, that maybe the mouse jiggler is part of that, but it's also, you know, whatever artistic intervention. So I wondered if you could maybe, you know, if anyone wanted to respond about how you might think about these different aspects um, or, you know, or perspectives or frameworks in relation to your own work and the types of, you know, interventions that you make. Do we have time to respond, or are we out of time? We have a short response. Do we have a brief response from one of our panelists? I mean, thank you for both of those comments and questions, yeah. I mean, in, 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 in part, the, the, the post-colonial compact, in a very simple way, was based on states saying to their citizens, if you behave, we'll take care of you. So that you know, so how in how many in how many contexts, the kind of unruly, uh, heretical, rough and tumble styles of everyday dealings, were, in some ways, uh, substituted by this sort of exigency to do the right thing, to to make sure that you play by the rules, that you go to school and get educated. To, because that will may, mean your livelihood will be... Uh, basically, that, that compact is finished. It's pretty, it's pretty, much, pretty much over. So in some ways, the, 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 the amplification of, of behaving badly, there's something Im, Im, important about that, that you know, returns in these, these, these critical moments. Grandmothers burying their breasts in fr in face of Lagos police when they have you know gotten gotten out of line. The the almost the entirety of Yangon the other day not taking to the streets, knowing full well that they'll but staying at home, so refusing to to appear in to to appear in 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 public. All the kids from the suburbs of of Jakarta taking the train to the center speaking new languages, disrespectful, I mean, so in, 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 in some ways, you know, given that that compact is over, how to behave badly, just this shade of the law, so that, you know, somehow you deliver a kind of performance that is not completely comprehensible or apprehendable. Great. Thank you. I think that's a great note for us to end on. Uh, so thank you to our three panelists and to Transmedia.